afternoon, everyone. You're all very welcome. Some new faces, some, um, well, not say old, but some familiar faces, shall we say. <laughs> Listen, thanks very much. Everybody with great turnout today. I'm really pleased to see you all. Um, I'm particularly pleased to welcome Dr. Catherine Higgins and Dr. John McMaster who are going to launch their books today. Now, before we do that, we need a tiny bit of housekeeping. Um, as you'll notice, there's a sign-in sheet going around the room. There's actually two of them today. So please make sure you sign in at some point so we have your details, your contact details and everything else. Please turn your phones to silent. Thank you very much. So we don't interrupt proceedings. Um, or you can turn them off, it's up to you. And I hope you all enjoyed your lunch. And um, good. <laughs> and you know, if you come here every week, we are good to you and we will feed you well. So listen, I'm just going to briefly do an introduction because really, uh, you know, we want to get to hear from our two guest speakers today. Um, Johnson and Kathy are senior researchers and writers with the Ethical and Shared Remembrance Project, um, which is managed by The Junction. And this is all around the decade of change and violence and around the decade of commemorations and the, centen the centenaries that are being celebrated between 1912 and 1922. Um, it, it explores and unpicks the hugely significant de decade as a means of better understanding the social political landscape of Ireland today. And today we're launching three books and these are a range of resources that, that are part of a range of resources that have been developed for trainers and educators and community relations pr practitioners. The first book is Personalities of the Decade, 1912 to 22, War and Memory, Remembering World War One, and Profiling Irish Women of the late 19th and early 20th century. <coughs> the project has been made possible through the Colin Bannis Trust with support from the Northern Ireland Community Relations Council. So really all it is, you know, all I need to say is to introduce our first speaker of the is Dr. Johnson McMaster, and we're very lucky to have them on their bunch of read little extracts from their books. And there will be an opportunity to purchase the books at the end, and do a wee bit of something. So, John McMaster, thank you. Susan, thank you very much, and uh, great to see all of you. And thank you for, for coming to this, um, well, book launch, plural, however you say that, uh, today. Um, we, what we're going to do is, I, I will speak for a little while. Uh, they will include some extracts from the book, some introduction. Cathy will do some reflection then also, in particular in the book on Profiling Irish Women. Uh, and then I will come back again to the War and Memory book. And uh, we will have some opportunity for questions or conversations after uh, we have spoken uh, and then the sale of the books and the signing uh, at, uh, towards the end. Now, the first, the first book we would like to focus on is, is Personalities of the Decade, 1912-1922. Um, now, this is a book about people. Uh, facts and figures do not make history interesting, but personalities and people do. And people are history makers, uh, and they're history makers for good and ill. And during the crucial decade of 1912-1922, there were key personalities, and there were key players. And I suppose one has got to say, being 100 years ago, that these politicians were exclusively male at that time. The, the book features four nationalist Republican political personalities. It features four unionist personalities and four British politicians, though one of the latter was not a constitutional politician, but rather a constitutional monarch. Now, they were all people of their time, like the rest of us. People of their time, limited by their time, who can only be judged critically within the context of their time. And so as personalities, they are, like the rest of us, flawed. And they are contradictory. We see genius in these people. We see flaws in their personalities. We see things to affirm and things that make us want uh, to cringe. But what would we have done? And would we have acted any differently had we been in political power in the decade 1912-1922? And so for better and worse, these 12 personalities shaped the rest of our 20th century in Ireland and their shadows fall on our still somewhat difficult pathway. They were, of course, not the only 
personalities and players. There were others, uh, but books and funding have limits and apologies if your favourite politician is your favourite politician of the revolution is not in these pages. Um, maybe we'll do another one sometime on other personalities of the decade. But just a quick test of, 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 of three of them. Uh, one from each, just to, to, to balance things out and, and, and be, be fair. Um, Edward Carson, the unionist, of, the unionist leader, uh, and the, the main person opposing home rule back in 1912, the years before and after. At the end of Carson's career in Northern Ireland, when he took leave of Northern Ireland and left, didn't come back too often after that, he made a remarkable speech to the Unionist Council. And this is what he said to them. You will be a parliament for the whole community. We used to say that we could not trust an Irish parliament in Dublin to do justice to the Protestant minority. Let us take care that that reproach can no longer be made against your parliament. And from the outset, let them see that the Catholic minority have nothing to fear from a Protestant majority. Let us take care that we win all that is best among those who have been opposed to us in the past in this community. And so I say, from the start, be tolerant to all religions. And while maintaining to the last your own traditions and your own citizenship, take care that similar rights are preserved for those who differ from us. Edward Carson in 1921. On the nationalist side was, was Michael Collins a towering kind of personality of the decade, a West Cork man, born near Clonakilty in, in, <coughs> in West Cork. And Collins uh, played a very significant role and sadly his life was ended when he was shot dead at Bill Nabla in West Cork in 1922. Here is a paragraph uh, on Collins. It begins by acknowledging that there was a power struggle and there was a power struggle between Collins and de Valera. In the end, Collins was dead, perhaps a victim of his own violence and brutality. But he and Dev must take responsibility for the civil war. But in the end, de Valera stuck with the Republic in a political fundamentalist mode, but later did regret his role in the treaty. Collins had emerged with all his violence and brutality as more of a Democrat, believing in the will of the Irish people. Who would have been the greater statesperson had they both lived to old age? That may be a matter of speculation. Would Ireland have been shaped differently had Collins survived? In the end, he was more committed to democracy, more open to compromise, and ready to build realistically on what he'd got. He contributed to one of the worst periods of violence in Irish history and left with others a legacy of physical force and violence. Had he lived? Perhaps he too, with the many others, would have settled into amnesia and tried to carry on as though the Civil War had not happened. The era which has been read through the prism of Collins and de Valera left Ireland with civil war politics and parties. And only in recent years has a Fianna Fáil minister been asked to address the annual commemoration of Michael Collins' death at Bill North and south, politics change slowly. And only now is a civil war beginning to be dealt with in a critical way. It has taken 90 years. Maybe Collins and de Valera will now be critically reappraised. Both have left large ethical questions. The third <coughs> personality for today is uh, David Lloyd George, the uh, British Prime Minister 
the Prime Minister who saw through partition in the end of the day. And Lloyd George was, of course, Welsh, something of, of, of a Celt. And the concluding paragraph of this book say something, hopefully, that goes to the heart of perhaps the personality of David Lloyd George. 1922, Lloyd George's time was over. All politi political careers come to an end or reach a sell-by date. He was an international statesperson who had walked on the world stage. He remains one of Britain's great prime ministers. He was largely responsible for the foundations of the welfare state, which despite its cur current creaking, remains one of the great achievements of British democracy and social reform. In Ireland, neither nationalists nor unionists had given him much recognition, more ignored on the unionist side, and perhaps dismissed among many nationalists. His was a long career of political artistry, and he was a political pragmatist. Like most politicians, he was in love with power. And that may have lessened or compromised his early commitment to Welsh home rule. When in power and at the heart of British power establishment, he was not the strong supporter of Irish home rule his Welshness might have suggested. Yet he was always a radical with a strong social conscience. He was a wartime prime minister with all the pressures of that period in history. And he was a coalition prime minister, never free from Tory demands, and in particular their commitment to Ulster Unionists. Sinn Féin abstentionism from the Commons left the field to the Unionists in Westminster at the crucial time for Ireland. In some sense, Lloyd George was in the shadow of the Conservatives. In relation to Nationalist Ireland, his pragmatism did leave room for grievance, though things are always more complex than later narratives suggest. His personal life was confused and confusing, clouded by moral ambivalence, yet shaped by a religious non-conformist conscience. He was a flawed genius. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to be um, speaking, first of all, to uh, the book Profiling <coughs> Irish Women. And then I'm going to say a wee bit about the two chapters that I wrote in the book, um, War and Memory. So here goes. Um, in December 1920, Hannah Sheehy Skeffington published the final issue of the suffrage newspaper, The Irish Citizen. She remarked with heavy heart that the women's emancipation movement was just marking time. In 1922, the Irish Free State Constitution established the equality of the sexes, and a similar equality was granted to women in Northern Ireland and Great Britain in 1928. Yet, these developments failed to deliver the socio-political and economic opportunities those at the vanguard of the women's movement had expected. So what went wrong? Were women not persuasive enough in their arguments? Did men not wish to share power? Were there other socio-cultural and political dynamics at work? Well, the book Profiling Irish Women Late 19th and Early 20th Centuries outlines and critiques the various complex factors that impacted the development of the women's, women's movement at that time. The women profiled in the book are drawn from the unionist, nationalist, labour and suffrage movements which dominated at that period. The book's style is a mix of historical overview and that's an attempt to set the socio-political and economic context of the time. But it also uses historical fiction that combines historical research and plausible fiction to fill in the gaps in the history of the women personalities outlined. And that's because it's quite difficult sometimes to get the information on the women because their histories have been sidelined very much by the male story. 
The women's accounts are written in the first person so that they can speak from the heart and speak their own truth. The hope is that as these women share their experiences, their aspirations and their fears, the reasons for the ultimate failure of feminism to liberate women will become clearer. There is no quick fix to establishing gender equality. But if we're serious about making it a reality in the 21st century in Ireland, North and South, then there has to be honest grappling with the obstacles that stood in its way a century ago, some of which are still live issues today. So I'm going to read just um, two short pieces or extracts from, from Women Profiled. The first is from Isabella Todd. So the year is 1893, and I'm t afraid you've caught me at a bad time. Prime Minister Gladstone has just introduced his second Home Rule Bill, and I'm feeling particularly depressed. Normally, I would describe myself as a positive and assertive woman, but this is a hard pill to swallow. Before I vent further, I'd better introduce myself. I'm Isabella Todd, 57 years of age, Presbyterian and a resident in Belfast some 30 years now. Now, where was I? Mm, I see from my notes I was referring to the second Home Rule Bill. Well, Gladstone has a fight on his hands, I can promise you that. How can I be so sure, you might ask? Fact is, I'm a founding member of the Ulster Women's Liberal Association, which was established to support the Liberal Unionist Party in its opposition to Home Rule. I started the association in 1888, two years after the first Home Rule Bill was introduced into Parliament. Five years on, and I'm as convinced as ever that Home Rule would be detrimental for all of us, but especially for women. Why do I think that? The answer is easy. I have campaigned for over 25 years to improve the lot of women socially, politically, economically, and I fear that under a Home Rule government, these gains would be gradually eroded. On a related issue, while I hold that each person has a right to belong to whichever religious tradition they feel at home in, I am deeply concerned over the Roman Catholic Church's power to influence social policy and practices in Ireland. I believe there's a close connection between Catholicism ignorance and poverty. My objection to Home Rule is not coming from any sectarian bias, but from my personal experience of that church's determination to limit women's freedom. When I was lobbying the government for a change to the University Bill, I discovered the Roman Catholic Church was opposed to the idea of universal higher education, particularly in its application to women. Women's struggle for equality, I believe, would suffer adversely in any state where that church had any say in policy decisions. Ulster, therefore, must take the lead in the struggle to preserve our civil and religious liberties. I know I can depend upon the women of Ulster who feel the danger of home rule as acutely as the men. They will continue to unite against this travesty of justice in spite of the setback of a second Home Rule Bill being passed. They will not protest on their own account, but for the sake of the future of all women in Ireland. We owe it to Ireland to raise our voices in solemn warning against Home Rule, the greatest threat to civilised society in our time. <laughs> Forceful woman. <laughs> okay. The second extract is from an imaginary letter that Hannah Sheehy Skeffington wrote to Anna Haslam, and she was another leading suffrage campaigner, and these women were in Dublin. So the, the location for this letter is Mountjoy Prison, and the date is July 1912. Dear Anna, it was so kind of you to visit last week and bring your pot of verbena and loganbury jam. My sister suffragists enjoyed it along with me. 
I was only sorry that the visit was so short. The allotted 15 minutes for each visitor really allows so little time for much beyond pleasantries and hearing some news of what's happening with the suffrage campaign in the outside world. It makes me so angry that our politicians lack the necessary backbone to stand up to Prime Minister Asquith, fearing he'll renege in his support for the Home Rule Bill if they insist the local government register become the basis for voting. We women pay our rates, and we should have a say in how our country is run. And we will continue our protest until we're granted the same rights as men. I appreciate, Anna, that we're pursuing different paths toward the same end, and that your Quaker principles prevent you from condoning any form of violence. As you know, my husband Frank is a pacifist and a committed supporter of women's suffrage and he, like you, believes the only way to achieve freedom for women is by using the weapons of intellect and will. This is why he recently launched the Irish Citizen newspaper to create a public forum to debate the issue of suffrage. Frank accepts, however, my right to adopt a militant stance. For as I told Frank before my trial, there is a tradition in Ireland of women throwing stones to defend their rights and homeland. During the siege of Limerick, the women defended themselves against the Williamites with stones. And the women used the same armory against the landlords during the Land League. For the first time though, we women are throwing the stone on our own behalf not on behalf of our men. And this, I think, is what the average man is struggling with, our supposed unwomanly selfishness. The problem is not the use of violence per se, but the use of violence by women for women. Can the Irish politicians not see they're operating a double standard? They believe it's legitimate for men to arm themselves to defend Home Rule, or in the case of the Ulster Unionists, to oppose it. There are more illegal guns passing hands than anyone cares to admit. But women arming themselves in the great battle for freedom from male rule? Well, that is a step too far, a punishable <coughs> offence. So that's the extract from Hannah's, Hannah's piece. Um, if you're reading this particular book and, and you find it interesting, you may wish to read chapter 7 of War and Memory, which deals with the women's war. In that chapter, you will meet three remarkable women who were among the women pacifists in World War I. Rosika Schwimmer was born in Budapest in 1877 to an upper-class Jewish family. Schwimmer established the Hungarian Feminist Association in 1904, and by 1919 she had obtained partial suffrage for women. By 1914 and the outbreak of war, Schwimmer was a well-known personality in the international suffrage movement and had been appointed press secretary of the International Women's Suffrage Alliance. Among other things, she helped organise the Women's Conference at The Hague that produced principles of a peace settlement that were later reflected in American President Wilson's 14 points, which he proposed at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. After the war, Schwimmer became a member of the new Hungarian government and held the post of Minister to Switzerland. However, a fascist regime, which was anti-Jewish, took control of Hungary in 1919 and Schwimmer had to be smuggled to Austria. In 1921, she travelled to America with a view to emigrating. Her pacifist work, however, was counted against her as attitudes towards the war had shifted and she was accused of being a German spy who had deliberately kept America out of the war for two years. She was denied American citizenship on the grounds that she would refuse to bear arms in time of war, 
but was allowed to remain in the country as her sister had previously emigrated and was able to provide financial support. In 1948, she was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by members of parliament in Britain, Hungary, Sweden, France and Italy. But unfortunately, she died before the award could be made. Another feminist who suffered for her pacifist beliefs was the French woman, Helene Brion. When the war first broke out in France in 1914, Brion, who was a nursery school teacher from the Parisian suburbs, fully supported the necessity for self-defence. She responded by setting up a soup kitchen in her community <laughs> to feed refugees who were fleeing the German army. As the war progressed, however, she became less convinced that the war was the best way to attain justice so she began to advocate for a negotiated peace by sending pacifist literature to other teachers and soldiers on the front line. In doing so, she was defying the French government directives which dictated, quote, teachers were to inculcate a belief in the certainty of French victory. Brion, as a woman and a feminist, in opposing militarism and dissenting from the male government perspective, was threatening the accepted social order and challenging the patriotic propaganda that expected women to support the war effort by keeping up morale. Her public trial and guilty verdict was an attempt by the military council to make an example of her. But her insistence that women had civil and political rights which were being ignored did much to inform the public who were reading the newspapers and following the trial. The courage and foresight she shew, showed in using the public platform to debate crucial issues and encourage critical thinking established her as a significant voice and leader during the first years of the World War. A third woman featured is Louis Bennett. Bennett was born into a wealthy Protestant Unionist middle-class family in Dublin. And Bennett recognised the importance of establishing links with suffragists from across the world. She was one of three women to attend the 7th Congress of the International Women's Suffrage Alliance in Budapest in 1913, the year before the war broke out. This international connection became vitally important for Bennett with the outbreak of war as it created a means by which she could maintain links with women in Europe, Austria, uh, sorry, Europe, Australia and the United States and support the work of the Organisation for World Peace. Bennett was also a contributor to the International Women's Suffrage Alliance Journal and her article entitled Women of Europe when will, you call, when will Your Call Ring Out, appeared in the 1st of May 1915 edition. In it she warned, and this is a quote, let us not blind ourselves with talk of the glories and heroisms of war. We dare not ignore the moral and spiritual wreckages that remain unchronicled. We have to think of men brutalized and driven to hideous deeds by their experiences of men with reason destroyed and nerves shattered, of men disgraced for lack of the cold courage that can face the horrors, of men with faith in good slain, their outlook on life eternally embittered. Nor do such losses fall upon men only. What of the women for whom the French government has to devise legislation to deter them from infanticide? In the last public interview she gave before her death, Bennett continued to emphasise the need for international cooperation between women in pursuit of the ideals she'd lived by all her life, the ideals of peace and freedom and justice. A second chapter in War and Memory, entitled The Poetics of War, looks at minor Irish poets. Minor because they were not prominent figures in the Irish literary scene. They include Francis Ledwidge, Monk Gibbon, Thomas Carn Duff, Winifred Letts, Patrick McGill, and Stephen Gwynne. I wonder how many of those are known by, by people here. Maybe, maybe Francis Ledwidge. Patrick, Patrick McGill. 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 Yeah. Yeah, he's Donegal. <laughs> uh, the Irish war poets fall into two camps. 
Those who bought into the ideology of blood sacrifice as cleansing and war as necessary for liberation, and those who began to question the concept of a just war and wonder if the men they were shooting at really were the enemy. Their poetry sheds light on a complex and disturbing time in world history and in Irish history. But above all else, the Irish war poets provide glimpses into the hearts of the emotions and longings that connect humanity. The chapter explores four key themes which recur in much of the Irish poetry. Firstly, the feeling of being abandoned by Ireland while at the front. Secondly, the reality of war. Thirdly, different perspectives on the enemy. And finally, memorialising the war. Remembering and commemorating the First World War needs to include a recovery of the perspectives of Irish poets who even in the most inhumane environments utilised their poetic talents to express their experiences, their aspirations and concerns. And finally, the third book, which um, Cathy has already uh, introduced and her contributions to it, War and, and Memory. Um, the, the decade itself, 1912-1922, is, is something which shaped the landscape of Ireland for the rest of the 20th century and left huge unresolved issues that uh, contributed to our much more recent violent conflict. But the defining event of that decade was the Great War, 1914-1918. It was a catastrophe and a calamity, and the legacy for the 20th century and beyond was also catastrophic and calamitous. It was a war that destroyed the peace of Europe, and it actually destroyed Europe, and redrew the map of the world. The Great War ought to be commemorated and remembered, but any sense of celebration or triumphalism on the part of any of the powers who were involved, I think would be obscene. How memory will be used and what rituals and language are used uh, will be of crucial significance over the next four years. And so in this book, there is the attempt uh, to reflect on the Great War and memory through an ethical prism. It begins with the imperial context that is crucial and essential for a critical understanding of the world that went to war. And it ends with an affirmation that humans always have choices, which means that there were, and always are, alternatives. The 20th century could have been different. And so can the 21st, depending on our choices. So some, some few extracts to finish this part of our session. Um, early on, we, we draw attention in, in the book to this imperial context that the world that went to war really consisted of six big empires and imperial powers. Austria-Hungary, sometimes known as the Habsburgs, Germany, Russia, France, Great Britain, and the Ottoman Empire. And they, in 1914, those six empires, occupied 84.4% of the planet. That's how powerful and extensive they were. But then the question we deal with in another chapter, why was the war shattered? Why was the peace, rather, shattered? Well, here's a concluding paragraph to, to a chapter. Austria-Hungary was defending its empire. Russia was in solidarity with fellow Slavs in the Balkans. The powers had already lined up in two alliances, Franco-Russian and Austro-German. The sick old man of Europe was terminally ill. That was the Ottoman Empire, but still capable of being a thorn in the Balkans. Britain was in a naval arms race with Germany's Kaiser. Kaiser Willem, back in the 1890s, had demanded a place in the sun for his empire. And Britain had an empire on which the sun, it was said, never set. So between 1882 and 1907, 
Europe had divided into two power blocks, the Triple Alliance of Germany, Austro-Hungary and Ottoman, and the Triple Entente of France, Russia and Britain. The spark that would ignite the powder keg was the assassination of the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, in Sarajevo, and Austro-Hungary's subsequent response to Serbia. They forced a war which they already felt was unavoidable and which they really wanted. The problem was it was never going to be just between Habsburgs and Slavs. And then the war itself through Sarajevo and at the end there was the Paris Peace Conference where the victorious powers, if you like, gathered to reshape a world that had been shattered at the end of that war. And we give a chapter in this book to the Paris Peace Conference itself. Now, it's a significant conference because the legacy of that conference ripples right down to the world we live in today. We cannot understand any of the Middle East without understanding what France and Britain carved up for themselves in 1919, 1922. We cannot understand what is going on, I suggest, with Islamic State, unless we understand the boundaries and borders that were imposed on the Middle East and what happened to the empires that collapsed and crashed in 1918, 1922. So they had a number of peace treaties in Paris. The chapter concludes with this paragraph. The peace treaties of Paris did not deliver because ultimately the principle of self-determination for all its rhetoric and piety was trumped by European and American imperialism. Powers wanted to rule, still wanted to rule, the rest of the world. As one observer put it, the old hag of colonialism puts on a fig leaf and calls itself a mandate. Versailles was about mandatory empire. The problem was that after the catastrophic war, the powers could no longer pay for their imperial privileges. Maybe the most provocative chapter in the book, you can judge when you buy it, is the one about the war god. Um, and it raises all sorts of um, critical questions which do need to be asked. Who is this war god that they all talked about in, in 1914 and 1918? And then the chapter comes to this conclusion. The holy war and the war god cannot now be written out of World War I history or be ignored. Whatever the future holds and whatever future wars will be fought, is it time for religions to call a moratorium on holy wars, on all images of a war god and all use of God and God's name when wars are fought. This would also be a moratorium on the invoking of God or use of God in all war remembering and memorialization. And if the latter is felt to be a step too far, then certainly a moratorium on how God is used at present. And when you read the book, you will find that God is being spelt with a small g intentionally. Despite what a Scottish moderator said in 1916, a Presbyterian moderator in Scotland said in 1916, in religions where peace is fundamental and final, there is no place for a war god. The war god is an idol. And the faith response is atheism. And finally, the politics of, of memory. Um, a contentious area always and we 
we say something on that um, in, in towards the end of, of, of that, that chapter. Something that has, I think, quite a bit to say if you only think of it in terms of our own situation within Ireland or Northern Ireland. But it's European and it's global as well. It is possible in any society to develop a memory addiction. The past becomes an obsession without which there is no identity and a dependence on memory or memorialization becomes absolutely essential for perceived or imagined identity. In this condition, we end up with a surplus of memory, more than is needed. A fixation with the past also tends to hypersensitivity. Offence is easily taken if a past is perceived to be threatened by alternative interpretation or critical questioning. Even being confronted with the complexity of the past or its plurality of narratives can cause offence, certainly fear and anxiety. If the past becomes an indispensable site of memory and its mono-narrative is forced on others as exclusive norm, then history becomes locked in a siege mentality. Sites of memory become, quote, a garrison of identity politics as well as bastions of exclusion and atrocity. Now that raises, I think, critical questions for us. One other line with which I finish. The memory, remembering and commemoration are not the problem. The problem lies in the motives that drive our need for memory, remembering and commemoration. So we recommend that you buy all three books <laughs> and, and read them from cover to cover. Um, but we're quite happy in the last eight minutes or so yeah. to have a conversation. Yeah. Are you doing buy one, get one free? <laughs> no, no, but I think, I think they, uh, well, it's more or less is that. Susan has that information, I think. Yes, actually, the books are available to buy from Joe. I, I can't remember what <laughs> was decided, but... Uh, Oh, we, we're not in receipt of loyal. Let, let me hasten to. We're, we're not in receipt of royalties, by the way. It's all part of the project and the resources for the project. Now, the books are available to buy today at a special discount for one day only. They're normally ten pounds each, but if you buy them today, they're eight pounds each. If you buy all three together, they're twenty pounds. So that's a bargain. Hmm. So um, I'm just going to the last 10, 15 minutes or so. I'm sure people have plenty of questions that. Um, I have to say now, just hearing from both of you there, that really has whetted the appetite for three books. Now it's, it's very interesting what you're saying at the very end there, Jonathan, about the what about the look down the memory and the bit memory addiction. It's a very interesting concept. Yes, it is. You know, I think it, it does raise a lot of questions for us now when we're looking at not just commemorating decades, but also from our last 40 years of history. I just I mean, I find that very interesting and it's kind of raising a lot more questions than it's that's going on to but that's a good thing. So I'm not going to keep talking. Is there anybody any questions from the floor at all? Anything at all for Kathy or Dr. Singh? Yeah. If you want to stand up in this room, you can see. Yeah, right. The context is only from the committee or whatever was formed or are there outside contributors as well? Oh, the, these three books? No, main book that is your commemoration towards the 1912 or especially the First World War. <coughs> this one? Yeah. The, Cathy the, uh, has written... Any references or outside contributor at all? No, it's just a You mean as writer, the authors? Yeah. Yeah, yeah the yeah. authors are Cathy yeah. and myself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it draws on, it draws on extensive research. Because I have read about First World War plenty of places. Yeah. But there are different references. Yeah, yeah. But though, though I take your point, it has changed the history forever, yeah. Ottoman Empire broke, yeah. and everything, African countries lined around this country becomes mm -hmm. this country, and Syrian war and all this is a part of it now what we are facing at the moment. Sure, exactly. I mean, I, I think the, 
I think the, the Great War, we call it the Great War for whatever reason, has been the defining event of the 20th century and, and still defines us. And, and I think if we, well, as a, I think a legacy of, 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 of that war, yeah, we, have, we still have... Yeah. The English, English and French <coughs> divided the yeah. Syria, whatever yeah. way the lines are there. You know, so yeah. the Borders were imposed right across the Middle East on very artificial ways and very sectarian lines. Uh, disreputable people put in power very often. And today we have a humanitarian crisis, the worst that we've had for years in Syria. We've had the crisis in Gaza, Israel-Palestine, which nobody can resolve. And we have got the mess in Iraq. And all of that comes out of World War I. Maybe you should get complimentary copies of that last book to certain institutions. Here in particular, yes, yeah. yeah. Such as, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I'm, th I'm thinking of the the loyalist orders oh, yeah, in particular. Stormist, yeah, politicians. Yeah, yeah. yeah. all of our politicians make you know have a lot to learn, and I think part of the project I'm working with, correct me if I'm wrong, it's all around the ethical and shared remembering. So it's, it's, yes. you're very, you're obviously very clear at the start, Johnson, about, you know, get on the balance, because there are two sides to every story mm -hmm. at the end of the day, and it is about the balance, so, you, you know, you're going to take what you can out of these books, and I know that you have tried as best as possible to balance it out, in terms of which side you're, you're looking at, and that's, you know, what, what happens here in, this, in our communities, and so, you know, it's, whose side is it, you know? So I hope that everybody can get something out of it, you know, and I'm sure I'm, I'm looking forward to having to delve into these books. And I mean, I think they're very much, you can dip in and out of them as well. Mm -hmm. That's a chance to make sure you can cover, cover all three of them, yes. Uh, with reference to your comment about the war god, uh, just interested, do you still see a role for a padre in a military context? That, that is a big question it's been a big question for a long time what's the role of padres what's the role of, of chaplains to to um, to armed forces uh, and I think on one side there is the I think there is the positive argument that um, in war situations people are facing enormous suffering enormous catastrophe uh, the mud and the blood of those trenches and I think some of the stories that have emerged of heroic war chaplains who stood literally beside men dying, um, men confused, men um, out of their minds even, very often. Um, and I think, I think they, they have played uh, a particular role. And if one reads the work of, and there is a book published recently on Studdard Kennedy, who was otherwise known as Woodbine Willie, you begin to see a chaplain who not only did all of that, but began increasingly to raise critical questions about war and about violence and why his country was in the thing in the first place. So I think you have another issue whenever chaplains uncritically go into a war situation colluding with the powers that be and, and the status quo and don't raise any critical questions. So I think you get two types, but, but, uh, but I think there has been the role very often of very critical war chaplains, but, but above all chaplains who have stood beside not soldiers, but human beings who have been suffering. There was once said of the, there was actually two, two chaplains here in the city who were decorated, Jim Bruce Wynne Barr, mm -hmm. the Reverend Alexander Spence, who's in the Marble Memorial Association of Christ Church, one of the Cross, <coughs> and the Reverend Patton. The Presbyterian chaplain to the 10th on Skillings, who was, I think it was decorated with one of the cross with two bars, you know. And um, it was actually described by him that he was a man's man. He was there with a man, you know, continuously in his way we all thought of like other men, you know. So, what you're saying, some of these chaplains were very, very, very men, you know, and were, were decorated, you know. I was Joe, Joe, I think I had up for a while. Uh, just really quickly, I wanted to ask you about the moratorium on God in, in memory and memorializing the Great War. Is there a difference between saying like those who were killed in, in World War One are with God versus those versus God having being out front of those? Is there a difference 
would you say for a moratorium on one or a moratorium on all uses of God in, in commemoration? Well, I, th I, I, don't, I think when I talked about a moratorium, I was thinking of the way in which the First World War, each of the six big empires that went to war with each other, they were all in different language uh, proclaiming that they were fighting a holy war. And everybody believed God was on their side which must have been terribly confusing for God, but th there you go. <laughs> but, but, but there was this identification of God with your cause. And, and that was actually used in terms of recruitment. That was used, uh, churches and religious institutions became recruiting agencies in many ways. Uh, and, and perhaps as the war cranked up, the whole God thing cranked up along with it. Now the question I'm trying to raise here is, who is this God of war? And it's a similar question to be asked, who is the God in a national constitution? Is that a nationalistic projection? Is that a projection of angst and fear and our own internal violence? And it's why I've used the word God in this chapter very often with a small g. Now, what the reality is, um, that becomes the mystery that human beings can never fully define, I think. But, but, but I think there, is, there are critical questions to be raised, and, and this chapter is trying to raise those critical questions in relation to the way in which G.O.D. is used when it comes to, to killing and war and violence. Yeah, similarly the... Muslims, Allah who Akbar, God is great. Both sides of the same yeah. thing is saying there. Yeah. Either they are Shias or Sunnis use the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Even there? Is a question for Kathy. <laughs> Good man, Eamon. <laughs> uh, I was interested in the decision to write as it, as it struck me anyway, as I understood it, yeah. as if you were the person. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's that moment where you haven't been the person, yeah. you, you kind of sighed and reached for the glass of water. <laughs> uh, so what was the motivation to write in that way? And also I'm interested in what is the relevance? I mean, there's a lot of women in this room. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the relevance for peace and woman now mm -hmm. in what you've written? Two oh, so, yeah, yeah. Um, I think, well, the motivation was, um, I, th I think sometimes with writing, um, if you can try and, and, and get to the, the, the spirit of the person or the heart of the person or their truth or something about who they are uh, and, <coughs> and, and convey that um, as, as well as what their ideas were so that y you can recover a sense of the whole person. Uh, and... Um, I mean, I find it an interesting exercise because I had to try and get into the mindsets of unionists, of nationalists, of labour and of suffragists. And, and to do that, you really have to try and understand where they're coming from. Okay? So even the exercise for me of doing it was, was, was an exercise in trying to, to, to understand the other sides. You know? um, so um, I think it's to try and, and show that a person is, is, is more than, than what they say and what they do. That, 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 and, and to get into to, to, to the, 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 um, the spirit of the person. You know. So that was my, that was my attempt. It, it also was necessary in some cases because um, the, the information on, on many of the women is not as, as available. You know, the, uh, the, the, I had to do quite a lot of searching to get stuff on, on women who are fairly obscure. You know, um, or you were hearing about what what these women did from other perspectives rather than from the woman herself. So it was also an attempt to recover their voices and, and give them a voice, um, and to, to make the point that that um, what we do always in reading, whether it's history or historical fiction, is interpretation. You know, there's not a, the, you know the the, the 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 books that we're reading about people are people's interpretation of that person. You know, so um, in, in doing that exercise as well, I, I'm, I'm trying to highlight that 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 um, writing, 
research is interpretation, you know? And, and I think it's about freeing the imagination up to, 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 to recognise um, that um, uh, the person is, is part of a context, but the person also raises questions for us now, you know? And for me, it was very much about, about uh, taking these women seriously, recognising the limitations that they were working within, realising how they worked together, but also how they missed opportunities, realising that um, many of the women who did come together and, 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 and were closed off to other groups missed missed the perspectives that were on offer, you know, and, and, and that, that part of the reason why I think the, the feminist movement failed at that period was because um, the women themselves uh, were not convinced, not all of them, of the importance of uh, the women's movement and of the contribution that women could make. And, and the, cultural, um, the cultural outlook at the time uh, which was that, that women were there to serve men and that w men could do a better job um, or that uh, political and constitutional issues were more important than, than issues around gender, that, 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 that they were allowed to take precedence. You know? And I think if, if, if the women had really um, tried to understand each other across the community, whether they were supporters of home rule or against home rule or, or Republicans or unionists, that, that there, there would have been a much more um, earthed women's movement. So I think we can learn from them. Does that sort of answer? Yeah. yeah. So um, the second part of my question is around um, the well, I would like a wee bit more clarification as to how you see the relevance of those women's stories, those recovered voices, mm -hmm. as it were, now, mm -hmm. here, as we look to build peace. Yeah. Well, I think, I think what they do is they give us a, an insight into the importance of women in, 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 in contributing to peace or peace building, or um, contributing to an understanding of the communities that they come from, okay? But I think that they also, um, I think that, 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 that in some cases, the big issue for, for many of the women was, was the issue around the relationship between militarism and patriarchy. Um, and, and the fact that the feminist movement um, um, suffered because um, militarism, the First World War, and, 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 and the concern for power, whether it be power within particular constitutional governments or world power, sidelined other issues. So I think that they throw a critical light on, on, on things like um, uh, patriarchy, uh, the connection between patriarchy and militarism, uh, the, the need for inclusivity, uh, the need for um, a real attempt to understand what it is that, 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 that is driving the person, you know, what their motives are. Uh, and um, that's as much as I can think of off the, off the cuff. Yeah. yeah. And we're just time for quickly one more, and then we start something. <laughs> Well, my, my, my question is very closely, very <coughs> close to Eamon's. Uh, I wasn't too comfortable with, you know, the, uh, uh, with the personification of the woman that is not neither historical or historical fiction, but mm -hmm. it's something in between. Mm -hmm. um, how does the reader know what is known and what is made up, or, or would you say that all that is made up is that you're putting it in the women's yeah. voices? I mean, I found myself even wondering, you know, did they allow or, or did prisoners actually get presents of jam? Did Hannah Sheen well, get presents? Yeah, that's the per, or yeah. actually have correspondence yeah. with the women's yeah. right? No, those, those are all based on research. Yeah, but uh, so yeah. How, how do you know when you're reading the book yeah. which things are? Yeah, are I think, which aren't. Yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, there are there are three chapters in the book that are historical chap that are written from an historical perspective in the sense that they give background, they set context, they explore some of the dynamics and explain it, you know, in, in a factual way. 
uh, the, the women that I looked at, um, the stuff that's in there has all been researched thoroughly. Uh, the bits that I suppose um, are, are added are an attempt to, I mean, the, 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 for instance, um, Hannah Sheehy Scaffington was in prison, Mountjoy Prison. Uh, she was visited and she wrote letters too. Do you know what I'm trying to say? But she didn't write that particular letter. You know, so 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 the, the the creation of the letter was a way of me uh, expressing something of what her ideas were, uh, what 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 her relationships were, what her her views were, and so on. So it was. I, I would, I would yeah, some more traditional, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. Just, sure. And, an actual letter yeah. Well, there, there's there is that out there. Yeah, there's an associated yeah. question that mm -hmm. did you try to, to actually use different styles of speech? Um, you're writing in the first person about each mm -hmm. one of these women, and in those cases where you had samples of speeches mm -hmm. they made or letters mm -hmm. they wrote or articles they wrote, did, did you try to use their style of language or? You know, when yeah. somebody knows that they're all actually the one person wrote every one of those. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I did try, but whether I succeeded or not is left to the reader to decide. I think you managed to read that with a lot of passion, and I, you know, it was, you know, it was very yeah. powerful when you were like Stanislavski. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think that approach could be quite effective if you're taking, you know, one story maybe for for uh, reading on the radio or something like that, you know, doing it live, but generally speaking, I, I would have my doubts about it. You know. but I, I think this, this is a subjective side of all of us, and different genre will appeal to different people. Uh, and I think there is a role for historical research, there is a role for historical fiction, there is a role for historical imagination. Not everybody will tune into all three of those or yeah, whatever. I can see what you're doing. I, I'm currently trying to do a fact for you, writing a book on fact based on fiction or fiction based on fact, whichever way you want to look at it. Yeah. And I think that what you're trying, what you're, you're just saying is that it's trying to be in the time of, in the context, in mm -hmm. that time and in that mm -hmm. context, mm -hmm. and to sort of pull in the things that you, you know from historical fact mm -hmm. that happened, mm -hmm. and draw on some a bit of fiction in order that we can maybe try and understand mm -hmm. uh, the bits that are missing. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's, a, that's a fair yeah. comment yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, yeah. because uh, how do we know? Uh, some, some things we will never know about mm -hmm. how people thought in those days, mm -hmm. because not everybody wrote mm -hmm. at first start. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're also talking about middle class people. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're not talking about the working classes. Mm -hmm the poor and the deprived, mm -hmm. who didn't write and didn't know anything, who were just laid along in, the, in yeah, this. Yeah. So uh, we have to use a wee bit of imagination, I think, mm -hmm. to try and, and fill in the blanks. Sure. And I think that's... Uh, I think that makes it accessible too. Yeah. Yeah. As I'm conscious of the time, and I know a lot of people are yeah. going to work. move on back to work or whatever, and there's a mad rush now to buy books. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's great. And that, and they will be hanging around and they'll sign some books as well. Dennis D N N I S. Two N 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 S.